Hello, everybody. I think my mic is just working just fine. This is another edition of Torn Tuesday. I'm on Twitter at the same time that I'm telling everybody welcome to our live show. We have a magnificent... Oh, wait, Justin's working it out. But we have a magnificent <laughs> panel of very special luminaries who are joining us to talk about some really in-depth popular culture wavelength that's going on here in our Tolkien fandom. You guys, this is the One Ring.net. It's Torn Tuesday. My name is Clifford Broadway. And as always, it is lovely to have you here to my immediate left or right. I'm not sure which way it is to the Emerald City. I think City. You're, you're in the center. To, I'm in the you, center. Okay. You well, were there's... just pointing at Kelly Rice, uh, co-author of Middle Earth, script to screen, the definitive uh, tomb, tome, the oh, a definitive yeah. hardcover book on the making of Peter Jackson. There he is hol holding it up right there. One of the heaviest books I own right here. <laughs> That's killer. Uh, Kelly Rice, of course, uh, co-wrote that with uh, Daniel Falconer and Peter Jackson over at Weta Workshop, and she's a former Weta person, employee, and worked with Peter and and the whole team, and she knows the whole history. Up in the corner, you just saw him holding up the book. That is Matt Nerd of the Rings, the number one Tolkien tuber, uh, approaching one million subscribers on YouTube, which yeah. is a huge huge thing so if you haven't subscribed to matt let's let's get him there before the next movie comes out uh or maybe before comic-con this year because uh oh, wouldn't it be man. cool to have a san diego comic-con million follower meetup that would be oh super. heck yeah <laughs> i would totally do that and then we're joined by a new guest to torn tuesday jason charles miller he is a multi-hyphenate as we say in the biz voice actor, musician. He has done the music for Critical Role. You might have heard some of it in the Vox Machina show. And uh, he is the voice of some of the orcs you hear in the Lord of the Rings video games. I think Rise to War is the latest one you were in? Yep. Yeah. I'm the voice of Ugthak in uh, Rise to War. So if you pick Isengard... I'm the general you get at the beginning of the game. That is Thanks. so badass. It's so great to have you all here. What a great assembly. Can I say, this is quite a show. This is so fantastic to have mm -hmm. you all here. Yeah, huge huge show. The chat room is buzzing right now. Uh, Kaylin Griffin says, Kelly Rice, I'm going to cry. It's been such a long time since Ooh. everyone's seen you. <laughs> Happy Hobbit, of course, was the YouTube channel to follow during the Hobbit years. And e even the actors on the set were watching you. <laughs> Hi, Kay. <laughs> well, we've got so much to talk about. As you see, I had to I had to list it out because there's there's so much to go over this week uh, that we're just we're just gonna we just put it in a list form. And Cliff, I guess let's start with the big big news that just happened late last week. The Warner Brothers folks have stepped up to plate to assert their legal rights and their interests, let's say, in the worlds of Arda, Lord of the Rings, and The Hobbit with that original licensing deal that they had from Saul Zent's company. That's right, the one going way, way back in time that Professor Tolkien actually did, did that deal when he was alive. So Warner Brothers is here actually saying, we're making more movies. We are so glad to announce that we're still going to work with Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, and he even confirmed it on social media, that that was a seismic bit of news because it means that currently, while Prime Video is very busy making a, a, a wonderful new season two of a streaming television series, The Rings of Power, over on the other side of town, right not far from me in Burbank, our friends at Warner Brothers are going to be busy making more Lord of the Rings motion pictures for theatrical release. Did I get any of that wrong, Justin? I know, I think you got it right. Uh, we have a couple articles up on the one ring dot net uh, with uh, uh, about the deal and everything we know about it. Of course, the ink is just fresh. Um, so I mm. wanted to get everybody here together to get our first gut instinct reactions over this because you know we've been reporting the rumors for over the last several months that amazon really wanted to shore up all the rights and you know be the one-stop 
Lord of the Rings shop. You know, they spent a billion dollars on season one of Lord of the Rings, and they have a 10-year deal for the TV series. And it just made sense. They bought Amazon, then spent $8 billion buying MGM, which had the Hobbit distribution rights. So it only made sense. Amazon, of course, they probably wanted the the, the, the movie rights as well. And we heard rumors a few weeks ago that they offered up to a billion dollars for the rights to the movies. And we just found out last week that Embracer, the, the rights owners, now have... That have 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 granted an extension. And we have to consider. We have to consider Peter Jackson now moving into a new position, like a Kevin Feige type of overseer over what the Warner Brothers' interests are with their theatrical work, in a sense. Yeah. So uh, let's start with uh, Jason. Uh, you've you've been involved in the most recent video games, but now uh, what? You know, you're a long term fan. Uh, yeah, believe super he, fan. You know, uh, not, weren't you I, at the Oscar parties way back when? Yep, twenty years ago. Now I was. At, <laughs> I, I I managed to weasel my way into your Oscar party. Uh, <laughs> I called somebody who called somebody who knew somebody who somehow knew that I existed and got me into the party. So it was the hottest ticket in town. I, I'm it, not not I, to gloat. Yeah, I can't but... believe I got in. Um, but uh, what I think is hilarious is the trash talk has already begun. Uh, between Amazon and Warner Brothers, it didn't take long. But uh, who was it on the on the red carpet? Somebody was at a premiere for Amazon that was already, you know, sort of defending Rings of Power and saying like, "Well, we've got our thing and they've got their thing." And I don't know. It seemed like shots were fired. Yeah, to- totally. Now, Kelly, you uh, wrote the book long after The Hobbit had been produced and out and everything what what do you, what was the vibe uh from uh, from all your friends at Weta? Did, are they done with middle earth or do you think they've just been itching to to get back in well they wouldn't want to speak for anyone really other than myself but the conversations i had especially with those of my generation were we all be most of us became aware that Weta existed through the original trilogy and it was that passion and love for that trilogy that made us be like, look at this amazing, beautiful, detailed, textured piece of art that touched so many people's lives that these creators made. And obviously, I mean, Tolkien was kind of a part of that. But um, and so we were all like kind of starry eyed thinking, I would love to contribute to a project like that in some way. And so most of um, the other artists who were working there who are around my age were, were all drawn in from the original trilogy. And a lot of them did get to see that dream to fruition by working on The Hobbit. Um, this was several years ago now that I was down there, but um, it's, to me, the love of Tolkien and the love of the source material was still alive and well. And I did not get the sense that uh, anyone would say no. Certainly not my co-author, certainly not Daniel Falconer. That man lives and breathes Tolkien. And um, he's one of, he would probably, he's so um, humble. He probably wouldn't appreciate me saying this, but he's a powerhouse designer there. And he's designed some of the most iconic uh, armors and characters that you see on screen. And I know he, he would probably jump at the chance to be involved. Mm-hmm. Matt, you were one of the first people to go live on YouTube with with reactions, and Cliff, I believe, joined you for an epic three or four yeah. hour just emotional thing. What what did you get from the pulse of fans? Uh, good, bad, indifferent, excited, nervous. So, um, Cliff, you might recall. Um, I I want to say it was close to it was either seventy nine or eighty percent were positive reactions um i took yeah, a poll you it, had it that was, it accurate something... numbers oh you took a poll yeah, well okay. i took a poll i took a poll yeah <laughs> that's that's what my moderators do is they uh write down and categorize every single chat uh but no we did we took a poll and we had you know uh excited you know leaning uh leaning positive leaning negative and you know dreading it or something like that and 80 percent were one of the two positive options um so yeah needless to say uh most of what um i have 
seen is excitement so far. I would I would back that up. The conversation is really wow, more Peter Jackson, Fran Walsh, Philippa Boyens, but it's also expanding the consciousness of fans who are not yet very much aware that the War of the Rohirrim is in production. Mm. I mean, yeah. as we continue to talk about it week after week, the, the the there's still some folks in the fandom who have a um, a dim awareness of the fact that Warner Brothers still has a stake in this game. But this recent announcement means that we dodged a whole corporate takeover. There was a thing that almost just happened. And Justin, it's it's fair to describe that instead of Bezos money coming in to take all the rights and put it all under one house, one production house, now you have different production houses that, and everyone has said this, this is the big bottom line, is that the competition in the marketplace is going to improve, hopefully, improve the efforts on both sides because they are not competing in television shows, but they are competing in media, even though the difference is between film and TV. But let's all talk about that. I really want to th- ask you yeah. guys, Kelly and uh, Jason, um, let's talk about what that bullet was that we dodged. What would it have been like if Prime Video had made a deal with the Embracer Group to exclude Warner Brothers from pursuing any other production interests? They would have maybe molded or changed the animation process of War of the Rohirrim or other future ideas to be more conforming with their world building in Rings of Power? Is that what we would have dealt with if we saw that happen? Well, let me give some context think, yeah. here because I found a quote from uh, when Christopher Tolkien in 2017 announced that he was uh, 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 stepping down from the Tolkien estate uh, mm-hmm. management. Um, uh, our friend um, uh, uh, Michael Martinez um, said, with Christopher's departure as an officer of the Tolkien estate, the long-awaited rights frenzy for Tolkien properties may soon begin. And sure enough, he was right on the money. And here we go mm-hmm. to today. In the Hollywood Reporter, Hollywood Reporter uh, is uh, says that uh, Warner Brothers CEO... Uh, David Zaslav uh, says expects um, one insider suggests that Warner Brothers hopes to turn Lord of the Rings into a Star Wars like franchise. And they go on to say that um, uh, Peter Jackson, um, you know, famously, you know, infamously reached uh, reached out to Amazon when they were doing their show and sources say Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh were very frustrated that so many believed they were involved with Amazon's show, uh, but Amazon oh. never called them back. Actually, I heard rumors that images of Peter Jackson's films were not allowed to be put up on the walls, in the design areas, in the hallways, in the story rooms, in the executive rooms. Nobody was allowed to put up any imagery from the previous six films. But that is an unconfirmed rumor. But what about the imagery in their minds? <laughs> yep. You can't take that out. You know, one thing uh, before we jump, before we keep going, there was one thing I did want to just sort of like see that I observed, you know, uh, is that when this news broke, even like some pretty big sort of nerd news sites were they didn't get a whole lot of information and so some people thought that the three movies were going to be remade Mm, like that was sort of the first jump reaction was everyone was like why are they going to remake lord of the rings then after that sort of subsided then you had a whole nother group that was like make a baron and luthien movie make the children of her movie and it's like but those rights haven't been sold yet so i just i saw like just massive confusion for days and but being being a being a fan that like looks into all of this stuff i sort of knew that it was only of course the hobbit and the trilogy that was on the table and everything they can pull from that um i'm hoping that those of course we're all hoping that those other uh books become available but as of now unless it's been done in secret nothing's been announced for that correct correct right 
Yeah. Okay. Correct. And uh, um, so just in that Hollywood Reporter article that you had pulled up, I noticed uh, the byline on that. It's a it mentions insiders worry that Tolkien's franchise isn't big enough for two rival visions. Um, and I honestly, I think the opposite. I think there absolutely is. Like if I mean, if Amazon is you know, if Rings of Power comes out with season two and just blows people away. Um, and then, you know, War of the Rohirrim or what, you know, you mean whatever if they comes stop out. the bloody mystery boxing? Yes, yes. That's part <laughs> well, of it. Yes. Uh, yeah, let's but all, all I'm saying is, is there like, hopefully what happens is iron sharpens iron here and both, you know, the ultimate win for fans would be two great, uh, universes happening from this well the question that the hollywood reporter posed let's let's throw it to kelly like is there enough in tolkien's legendarium for so much more content i mean if you have free reign of the appendices that's that's uh an imbecile's question like (laughs) there are so many stories that can be told from so many different angles and so many different ways. Sure. You may have to flesh out some of the plot points and some of the finer details yourself, but he did so much work even before his son, even before Christopher went through and tried to fill in the gaps. Tolkien himself did so much work on the backstories of almost everything that to me, it's a, it's a, Oh, this is a horrible analogy right now, but it's a gold mine. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 it's a gold mine. For storytelling, story for storytelling, it's very fertile ground. It's a mithril yeah. mine. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Just don't awaken the Balrog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wait, look, I, I, let's hold on, know, Justin. There's one more thing to remember because <laughs> Kelly's Kelly's right. Kelly, you're a thousand percent right. The Return of the King was supposed to be published on time. It was not published on time. It was delayed and delayed over and over again because Professor Tolkien was super busy hyper-building world details for the appendices, and the publisher had to wait until those appendices were ready. And it's part of the licensing that the Embracer Group has. It includes what's inside the pages of the book. And all that stuff in the appendices is not just a separate oh, look at the Second Age stuff that Prime is doing. But what Warner Brothers has access to is almost limitless. I absolutely back you up on that. Well, I'm, look, I'm hearing you. But but Jason, we watched three Hobbit movies, and all, everyone said it was like butter scraped over too much bread. I mean, uh, how, how, how did we go from like... Oh, these Hobbit movies, they put they they stretched it too thin to like, oh wow, there's so much. Ha, ha, like what's happening here? Right. Uh and was it was it the actor Topher Grace that did a uh he took all three movies and edited them into one? Yeah, yeah took, I think you know, so. Just took the book. Um I still need to find that somewhere on a it's on a torrent somewhere floating in space. Um yeah, I mean that's what I'm concerned about. You know, what 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 um what would be amazing is if the rights to the Silmarillion, Children of Her, and uh, Unfinished Tales, if, if all those were unleashed as well, I would say we've got an infinite, infinite amount. Um, but you're right. If, like, if there's just a small piece that they're going to expand completely on, uh, then I think the I think a lot of fans will be torn and will. Uh, it's just I'm I'm nervous you know it's like you're gonna show me a story in Tolkien's world but you don't but you can't show me Tolkien's stories it's his stories that that you know that move us right and of course his world building is second to none he built the whole world he built the whole language then he wrote the story but if we don't have that story or that message uh, I, I feel like it could be, uh, you know, diluted in some way and then, uh, you know, uh, not satisfactory, uh, to say the least. So what, so, I get but, that. But there, we there have are people in the chat saying exactly that. They, there's someone in our live chat now, hello, XOXO2000, who said, I don't want Middle Earth to turn into the MCU. I would rather wait 
10 years or more for a very, very good single adaptation than receive mediocre product every year or every other year. And I do get we, that. Do, uh, do, uh, what, what does the panel think of uh, Garfa Mayo is longtime staffer of the net. She's in the chat room saying... Uh, 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 where where was it? So Embracer is looking to squeeze stories until they run dry. Is that possible in Tolkien's Legendarium? Can you squeeze too much? It, it is there enough to squeeze? I think it's possible to do that anywhere. It depends on who's writing it. Yeah, you know, I mean that that's really I think that's really the key. I think we've learned uh, uh, that lesson of like depends on who's writing it. I mean, Matt, your your review for the season one of Rings of Power really dived into the writing as being yeah. the, the critical point of doing a Tolkien adaptation. Yeah, I you know there is a lot of things that I legitimately loved about season one of Rings of Power: uh, music, visuals. I think the cast was really really good. Um, I think the the weakest point was definitely the writing and some of the uh, original aspects to the show um, that, you know, and, and it kind of, uh, you know, this this is going to be my concern for any of these projects that we're um, looking at, you know, people pulling from the appendices, because at the end of the day, what you've got is notes and you've got, you know, War of the Rohirrim is actually... Um, a portion of, uh, you know, one that we have more spelled out than a lot of others that are in the appendices. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not concerned so much about the stories and the world um, because I think, I think it's easy, easier to translate visually. You know, we know, we know what, uh, what has worked really well with Middle Earth visually and what has worked well musically. The issue comes down to the writing and finding someone who can uh, write well enough that you could actually confuse some of their writing for Tolkien's is a tall task. And we've seen instances where that works works out. And, you know, there's people today even that will quote the Lord of the Rings films, not realizing that they are not Tolkien quotes. And when it's, you know, when it's really good, um, you know, that that's filling in those gaps really well. And here there's going to be a lot of gaps because you're going to have to come up with all that dialogue. Like War of the Rohirrim is one where there is very little dialogue. We have, you know, Helm Hammerhand uh, earning his nickname. Uh, I won't go into spoilers, but that's the only scene really that we have from that story with dialogue. Everything else they're going to have to make up. And, you know, it's the same for Rings of Power. It's going to be the same for... Um, a lot of these stories that I'm sure we're going to hypothesize about here today. Yeah, we've got, uh, uh, we're moving on to uh, uh, Amazon's reaction to the news, which I'm, I'm sure they're disappointed. We found out uh, Brandon Katz runs Parrot Analytics, one of the uh, biggest streaming Nielsen type uh, trackers that track actual viewership, um, which is kind of a black box of like, how popular are these shows? And he says, uh, you know, its first season, while popular, Rings of Power, failed to justify the record-breaking costs, and it divided Lord of the Rings fandom. It's starting from its back foot. Often when we see originally dominant franchises return to the big screen, general audience interest in similar projects can decline. Hope is that Lord of the Rings films create a cross-pollinating funnel of interest with ROP, but given the polarizing nature of the show that already has, I'm not sure. Already there's talk of Peter Jackson returning. Um, but, you know, if he's open to being involved, but it, he was open to being involved in Rings of Power, but wasn't used by the showrunners. If fans can get their fix of Lord of the Rings from the original godfather, Peter Jackson, there may not be as much demand for... Rings of Power. Mm. Mm. Okay. Inter interesting, <laughs> interesting perspective there. Do you guys agree with that? Like, hey, if we can get our Lord of the Rings fix with Peter Jackson involved, are we losing interest in Rings of Power already? I mean, not necessarily. I think that I think that you're gonna not have like repeat watches. 
But I think if someone really loved a new Peter Jackson movie or just another Lord of the Rings movie that came out and they're like, what's this Rings of Power series about? Uh, they'll either dig it or they won't, but they're going to watch it at least once. I don't know what that means for analytics or for making their money back, but I think that it, I think that it will uh, keep the interest alive. Then again, if you do have an MCU situation, I think even the most diehard, diehard Marvel fan probably hasn't seen all the movies now and all the series and everything else. Even, even Star Wars is the same way. How much time do we have to consume all of that, all of that media? So, uh, you know, hopefully they, they keep it, they keep it precious not to, you know, quality over quantity Yeah, for both. I is what I'm hoping. One of, one of the problems we're talking about, if I keep running with the dwarf metaphor, we're talking about mining Tolkien's material for story content. One of the issues I had with Rings of Power was my very first impression from the first teaser trailer, which I said, I'm not really getting the mythic tone I expect from Tolkien. And like, Matt, I know you and I have talked about this. Justin yeah. and I have talked about this. We've been trying to be like, well, where where is that coming from? And I realized there is so much power in storytelling and leaving questions mm, and yeah. for the reader or the viewer and leaving it as a shadowy past. There, There is so much in the, the tale of the War of the Ring that relies upon echoes of this heroic history that we don't really have fleshed out. We don't necessarily need it fleshed out. We see the ruins. We feel the nostalgia. We feel the gravity associated with objects. When I first saw the films, I hadn't read the books. I thought it sounded really dumb. I'm like, it's a movie better. It, it literally is a ring. It's not like a metaphor. It's just like a ring. And I was like a teenager. I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of stupid. But then, like, <laughs> I, I saw the film and it felt so authentic within the context of the world. And a lot of that is largely because he pulled from folklore, because he pulled from mythology and made kind of this quilted patchwork of something that felt so familiar and strange at the same time that it does, you know, there's there, all of us are included in this and probably everyone watching, if you're of a certain ilk, you're going to be pulled into that and submerged into it and find so much joy in there. But I do think that there's great danger of trying to over flesh out mm -hmm. something that should just be left in the shadows. Right. But I, 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 the thing I liked about Peter Jackson's style of filmmaking is that in the Hobbit movies, when we meet Thranduil and they start arguing over dragons and Thranduil like leans forward and half his face disappears and he says, don't, don't talk to me about dragons. I know too well. Uh, in one shot, in one visual effect, I have a whole history in my imagination now of like, yep. wait, right. What like like uh, and honestly, that's the first spinoff that I would do is Lee Pace as Thranduil doing whatever did that to his face. Like, <laughs> but but that's uh, that's the that's Tolkien just in the movies thing. though, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, okay, so but the, it was cool. So movie. so that's <laughs> so that's one of those things where like uh, something original to the films, like you know the we're we're not told exactly what thranduil does in the first age but it's it's one of those things you know they don't over explain it it's it's just it, it develops this relationship between thorn and thranduil a little bit it gives you some uh mystique and you know that that aspect we can obviously you know pick elements of the hobbit to uh have a negative reaction to but i i think you know as far as original creations like that's a tantalizing thing that they created with one small effect there um, that adds some depth and some mystery like Kelly's talking about that Tolkien was so good at alluding to things without explaining every every little detail. Well, this I also didn't question. know until that moment that the elves were capable of using a glamour mm, to yeah. change or improve their appearance, <laughs> which is something you see in other stories of the Fae or, you know, creatures who are beyond the veil especially in english folklore and you know it seemed very brand new to tolkien and yet it also seemed to fit it fit in right perfectly 
Well, d- does everybody on this panel, like, based on what Matt's reaction right now, like, that was only in the movie. Do yeah. we want the new movies to start with the book or start with something that Peter Jackson introduced? Or does it matter? Matters. I mean, the, the, the books are <laughs> the foundation for all of this. So I think, I think, you know, even Peter Jackson, you know, who, who obviously has created stuff for both of his trilogies. Like, you, you know, that starting with the books is the strongest foundation you can begin from. And I'd prefer to keep it that way. I mean, we're in an age where, in theory, AI could be writing the next Tolkien film. Right. And like, oh, no. You know, like, that scares me. Someone said in the chat that AI wrote Rings of Power. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Well, oh, my I have a quote from Jennifer Salky, the president and chief of Amazon Studios. Uh, she's comments on the latest that deal. It. That was uh, the... She says oh, she said it on a red carpet, right? Yeah, we love our original series. We're extremely proud of it and invested long term. We think there's definite we definitely think there's enough fan love to sustain ours for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like I said, you know, if if they both studios come out guns a blazing and just make excellent products, people are going to watch both. Like, you know, it, it would take a lot. Yeah. I mean, look, look where, you know, we talk about the Marvel thing now, which I think, you know, even Marvel themselves have have said that they're going to be pulling back because they acknowledge that there's this oversaturation now. Um, so so hopefully and Star Wars, you know, yeah, yeah. So hopefully these these studios learn from, you know, what other studios have done and know that they should walk before they try to run here. And just focus on telling some really, really good stories. Um, I love hearing those but, stories that come out and say, oh, we announced 2,000 uh, MCU films right. at the big D23, but now we're going to stop this one. We're going to pull yes, back on that one. Yeah. We're going to pull back on this one. You know, I love I love it when that happens. Yeah, just, just you know, take your time, announce, you know, maybe announce one or two, and then announce some more later, you know? Well, so, so do you guys not want peter jackson to walk out at comic-con hall h and have like a timeline that is 10 years long and like this we're doing this 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 and this i don't that would be so i so i said in my video on this topic justin uh that i would love for peter that was my (laughs) crazy hypothetical i was like could you imagine how much we would collectively lose our minds if warner brothers did a panel and they said all right, guys. Uh, yeah, we're going back to Middle Earth, and here's the overseeing head of story, executive producer Peter Jackson, and we would all lose our freaking minds. And all they would have to do is announce like one or two. Like, I mean, that Comic Con is what four months away, something like that. That's really fast to bust out a ten year plan, I think. <laughs> so maybe maybe we just focus on like a couple stories for now. I think it was J.R.R. Jokin who tweeted he wanted a comedy about Sam running for mayor. And I'm all in. I love that I mean, idea. That's a really good point. If we're going to have a plethora of material, I would love for it to be tonally different. And like like something like that, so tongue in cheek, obviously you're not supposed to take it seriously. Something like that would be really fun. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, like... What happened to Fatty Bulger? You know, I mean, like we could we could dig into all sorts of different different ways. Cliff, can a Lord of the Rings movie still feel Lord of the Rings if it's only in one genre? Meaning the upcoming anime film? Like the anime film, let's say there's a comedy movie, let's say there's a horror movie, let's say there's like a romantic drama of, uh, of Aragorn falling in love with Arwen o- over the years, like, uh, you know, the notebook style. Like, do you ha- always have to have a big orc battle in every Lord of the Rings film for it to feel Lord of the Rings? Not necessarily. No. The, uh, I think that there's. Definitely Did you mean to say celery? so much room. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry, guys, but you know, 
I think there's really that's an old Benny Hill joke. You'll have to. Oh, okay. It. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's really serial, is, okay. But, uh, <laughs> He's serial. Um, <laughs> the uh, the world is tonally different almost from chapter to chapter. Yeah. Take a look at how different your energy is in the narrative when the hobbits are discussing spoons and crops and things at that level. And then several chapters later, you're talking about the high and the wise and the mighty lords who are, you know, at a whole different level of linguistic play. You know, Tolkien changed his level of linguistic play because he wanted the tone of it to be that different in different areas. So why the hell not? Why not? So if if I could add to this, I think mm. I cuz I've seen a lot of these suggestions where people say like, "Oh, I want a, I want a comedy set in Miller, I want like a horror, I want a romance." And I th I think part of what Peter Jackson captured really well with The Lord of the Rings is that there's elements of this in all of these in Tolkien. Right. And so, you know, just just picking one almost seems like setting the focus too narrow just this is just my off the top of the, my head thoughts here but i think you know you look at like a young aragorn story for perhaps you'll have battles in there you know he fights in rohan and gondor and fights against the corsairs which might be the climax of the story but he you could also have him meeting arwen for the first time and falling in love with her so you'd have some romance you'd have your action you'd have um you know some of that uh um, you know, that lone wolf kind of thing where he's traveling and going on these adventures and stuff. So, yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, a, some of these boy, elements. A boy that, named Estelle. A boy named Estelle, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, he, so I, I think I think there's some, you know, there could be a, a mixture of these genres that, that pop up in, in a single story. Kelly, do you... Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a rom com though, it's got to be Tom Bombadil and Goldberry. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's he, he didn't deserve her, did he? <laughs> and he knew it. Um, I do was know, gonna ask. Do you know, we used to joke a lot about what life was like for Marion Pippin at one point, and we thought, why don't we make the Hardy Boys mysteries with little Hobbit mysteries being, you know, a weekly episodic thing, and it's Marion Pippin trying to solve local crimes, like the goat that went missing from it. the farmer's stable, things like that. Yeah. I love it. Do we, <laughs> with two uh, competing really not studios, idea, is it? With, with Amazon doing TV shows and Warner Brothers doing movies, would we want to see, or would, would it be interesting if both did their own versions of the young Aragorn? What if Amazon called the Russo brothers back and said, hey, we told you no a few years ago, but let's do it. Russo Brothers doing a Young Aragorn TV series. At the same time, that Warner Brothers does their own version of Young imagine, Aragorn. Imagine, one, imagine somebody does the hunt for Gollum, while somebody else does a more focused Young Aragorn story. But do, do right? we want that as fans? Do we, do we want the same stories told different ways? Or should the stu two oh. studios stay in their ages? I mean, how many Spider-Man reboots have we had in the last 15 years? So, I mean, I right. guess it's possible. Did I want that? How many times have I seen Batman's parents get killed? I don't know, you know, but uh, my, my instinct is no, but my thought is, are we going to get it? Yeah, probably. I mean, it'd be nice if they weren't like in the same year. Like, yeah. you know, I don't I don't want like an Armageddon deep impact kind of situation, <laughs> you know, like we don't need to. <laughs> We don't need to like directly do it right at the same time, but I mean, you know, so say say one of them releases a young Aragorn and it's like, oh, it's that was all right. I think we can do better. You know, we have this other angle that we're going for and we think, you know, we can tell that story better than, yeah, I mean, why not? Everyone loved young Indiana Jones. Everyone loved River Phoenix doing something interesting like that. And everyone loved it. Spielberg wanted to play with television the way that he had been doing amazing things with films. So why the hell not? Why couldn't there be different young Aragorn stories? Maybe it could work out uh, like you were just saying, depending upon the approach. There's two flashes right now. There's the movie Flash. 
And then there's a TV show yeah, Flash. But I think the difference is that with Tolkien, he, you know, the the writing is so precious to us as fans, yeah. right? Like it, mm-hmm. you know, it, it there there's something there's just something that runs deeper than two different versions of the Flash. Yeah. And so I think that's where you'll get pushback from the fans uh, because they have shaped, I think, our 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 lives and the way we think about the world more. Yeah. And I think think one thing it really comes down to is greed and disrespect. And so as soon as, as, as a viewer, as a fan, I feel like um, someone's just producing this content for, for the money. I'm immediately a little turned off. Yeah. And I know obviously everyone's doing it for a profit. We live in a capitalist society. That's not shocking news, but that's where disrespect comes into play where you feel like, okay, you think that just because I'm a fan of this work, I'm going to, I have a button that you could just push and I get triggered to, you know, instantly be in love with whatever you've done. And um, I don't, I don't think, I think that that really backfires. And I think that that's part of what's going on with the Marvel universe and um one of the things that peter jackson in the original trilogy did so well is they didn't dumb stuff down mm-hmm. they gave all the information and trusted that the audience would catch up and i was a child like i was 17 when i saw the first film in the theaters so much of it went over my head that i was actually frustrated because i was like I haven't read the book. I'm missing everything. And then I calmed down and I went back and I watched it again at my house. And that's when um, I really got entranced and then picked up the books. So dumbing it down. And that was a big mistake. I felt like Rings of Power did. Mm -hmm. Um, They broke to me what is a cardinal rule of writing. You're supposed to show, not tell, especially in a visual medium. And there was a lot of characters painfully spelling things out. Yeah. Um, some of that could be because they were trying to make it a family friendly show to bring like younger members of the audience up to speed. But to me as an adult, um, it felt a little, um, it felt overbearing and it, it made me feel like, do you think I'm dumb? Which immediately turns off your emotional connection and pulls you out of the story. Well, curious along that same note, I think and Matt, you you had uh, an opinion on this. Let me uh, bring this up on screen. Uh, Charlotte Brandstrom, uh, the only director to go from season one to season two. She's currently doing season two, uh, directing two episodes. Um, she says uh, in an interview this week. Uh, the question was, was the reaction from the audience as expected for the first season of Rings of Power? And Charlotte says, the reactions was definitely as expected. Many loved it, and many had decided in advance that they didn't want to like it. Uh, I feel like that's too binary of a, yeah. of, 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 a, of a categorization. I mean, I think most fans fall right in the middle... Uh, but uh, Matt, yeah, I mean, you you kind of like hinted at at some of this in your season one review video on YouTube. Yeah. That yeah, um, and I don't know, like you know, this is obviously uh, I think this was translated to to English, um, but I you know I I re- did a quote tweet and just said, FYI, these aren't the only two categories of fans <laughs> that watched Rings of Power. And I'm not saying that that's what Charlotte thinks, but there's been a couple times where we've heard similar phrasing um, from mm-hmm. folks involved with the show. And it it just really rubs me the l- wrong way when it's implied that those are the only two um, because because there's not like it, it's just not like they're, well, yeah, they're... The, the implication then is the people who don't like it never gave it a chance. It's right. not we had an opportunity and we lost their interest. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank it, you for it, saying that. Yeah. Thank it, you for saying that. Both of you. Yeah. It, it just shows, you know, it's. And then I, it I, I hope any that's... criticism that we have too, right. because then it's like, Oh, you just didn't want to like it from the beginning. And that's not really fair. Cause I think we all really wanted to like it. You're so right. You're so right. And, and but... you know what? I'm still struggling with me. Look at, I'm the last person in the room who hasn't even written their bloody season one review. 
We know, Cliff. I'm still struggling with my ambivalence yeah. about it. And yeah. I didn't want to be in that position. None of us wanted to be in this position of being ambivalent about the rings of power. We wanted to love it. We wanted to be really absorbed by it. And I was absorbed part way as much as I was magnetically pushed out of it part way because of things that were quite daft with, you know, the decisions they made in the writer's room. While I was so absorbed in the production design and the music and the exceptional, exceptional work of the cast. Whoa. Best golden marks to all those people for getting a really well-rounded and really dynamic group of talented folks to put this stuff together. And, you know, I, I don't want to be ambivalent about any of this. I want to sit down and say, I, I want to watch it again. I want to think about it some more. I want to peel the layers of the onion, donkey. I want to see the layers of the onion. I want to get more to what's the meat and potatoes that they really are going to give us. And you know what? It's being reserved for later seasons. And I'm struggling with a lot of the mystery boxing and the, the elaborate TV style setups, you know, that kind of thing. But sorry, yeah. rant off. I mean, look, there and, was a lot, not to get like, in, not to get into the weeds or anything, but there was a lot of surprises that were really positive about the show, too. I mean, I did not think that a character that the TV show created, Adar, would be my favorite character. But yeah. just the way that it, the way that he acted uh, those lines, the way that, you know, he, he portrayed that character made me a huge fan, uh, not only of Joseph, but of of Adar, this TV created character, it blew me away. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to salvage from there, yeah. but, but yeah, there's also, you know, they've, they've like got a I, long way to go. I'm a fiction author. And I also, you know, obviously I've been through a lot of workshops, having my own stuff workshopped and I work with other fiction authors and, and I really just wanted to get a hold of the scripts and be like, <laughs> look at this, look at a character like Adar, look at how you've expanded upon the orcs and orc culture. Look at this one line Galadriel said, look at these brilliant things. Now compare it to this really <laughs> mediocre moment. Yeah. You can, you did this. You can make that this level. Like this is within your skill set. So let's try it. Like, but I, said, if, <laughs> if I could just say like, just one final word on the, the comment about the, like the two camps, um, I, I think, you know, those two camps do exist. Like there are a hundred percent. There are people who absolutely adore this show. They love it. No notes, whatever. Like that's, that's totally cool. And there are a hundred percent. There are people that did not give this show a chance from day one. That, that is true. But yeah. we, if, for those who, who pretend that those are the only two camps are doing a massive disservice, they're, they're, lying to themselves and i hope that's not yes what what amazon is taking away from this or what they are you know you know if they're doing this for pr spin like whatever i i get it it's part of the game but hopefully internally they are looking because i think you know it might be 10 percent on either extreme but i think 80 percent of the fandom is in the middle somewhere and that's that's where you should be listening to is the people that fall in that 80 percent and when you make comments like this that say people either absolutely adored this show or they hated it because they're haters and they never gave it a chance, you're insulting that 80 percent. Who and want to big, champion your show. Yes. Who want like, to be your biggest fans. Yes. A lot of nobody, nobody who is a huge fan of Tolkien goes into an adaptation saying, I want to hate this, you know? Well, and, Matt, imagine of Gondor, one of the chatters just said he bought an OLED TV for this show and he's not happy <laughs> oh, <no>. with the result. <laughs> so is that a is that a bad review for the show or the TV? Which what model? <laughs> <is that? laughs> we need it. Well, Amazon will tell you it's it's a TV review. Uh, moving <laughs> on. Uh, but you guys talk about the quality show. Well, we've got some new Rings of Power set photos that might start to show oh, yeah. some quality and and cliff i don't think i don't think i showed you these cliff um no you didn't here we go because <laughs> that's the way we do this bloody show i'm flying blind and justin surprises me by the seat of my britches 
He's well, trying not to interrupt your writing process for your stinking review, I, Cliff. I don't want to distract you from Get getting your done. work done. Get your work done. So uh, you have seen photos of Bray Studios outside of Windsor. This is about 10 minutes out from Windsor Castle. You might remember that back in May and back in October, I visited this and I got the first photos uh, of this wow. area before they started building, um, because I had heard whispers that they were going to build at Bray. And sure enough, they took over Bray Studios. These are brand new set photos. Um, you've seen these You've seen these sets before, but they're a little more built. And Cliff, I wanted to uh, direct your eye to a brand new statue in the middle of the courtyard. How about that statue? The one that everybody is talking about with... Uh possible earrings with a possible Feanorian connection. Boy, there's been some really interesting Twitter speculation on this. Are we going to zoom in on that bad boy? We're going right to zoom there? in on yeah. the face of the statue. And why would why would the first jump in our logic be that must be Feanor? When, you know, Tolkien said that the elves didn't make statues of themselves as much as Numenorians did. Kelly, what do you think about that? I mean, the idea of elves making all these effigies and statues of someone like Feanor? Why would Feanor, of all people, get a statue? Wait, are you saying this is against the lore? Are you saying that this is a misstep already? Well, I mean, uh, we've learned that TV Celebrimbor really worships his grandfather right that's right that's what they've sort of shown us that so that's right i feel like the, it does fall in with tv Celebrimbor uh lore i mean if this statue was in uh linden i would have some a lot more questions <laughs> but if it's in a region you know home of the jewel smiths uh the Gwythi Myrdine and you know, this is Celebrimbor's grandfather, and he is a legendary. I mean, we're told Celebrimbor is the second greatest smith to his grandfather. Um, so despite all of the terrible stuff that Feanor did, if he was going to have a statue, I suppose this is the most logical place to have it. I guess so. Okay. I'll, I mean, terrible stuff that he did. And look at all the people online who are like, hashtag Feanor did nothing wrong. That's just here. a whole... Uh, I, I love that hashtag. crazy. Feanor did everything wrong, folks. The, the, reason, to break it to the you. reason we know this is Feanor is not only is he holding a Silmaril in his uh, right hand, in his left hand, there is the Feanor's hammer straight up the same wow. hammer. I still want a replica of that thing so bad. So, wow. yeah, Embracer Dang. and Amazon, can you get this merch going? Uh, so, yeah. uh, there is Feanor holding his hammer and holding a Silmaril. Wow. Uh, straight up like this is this is fresh from the set just finished and um sleuths on the internet have deduct deduced that this guy who was announced joining season two um uh, is will keen and he has striking gray blue eyes that you can't see in this black and white photo <laughs> so uh side by side will keen and Feanor, every it, it, it's almost like a, a, a shoe in that we we have our first new actor and character for season two. This is the face of Feanor. Obviously, guys, this must be a flashback scene, right? There's no way that Feanor is alive. In no way, but why flashbacks? How much of Feanor's story is going to be imperative? for the rest of the story that they're putting forward for season two. I really would love to hear some of your thoughts on this, Jason, Kelly, Matt. Well, back to that hammer. I want two because I want one to put on my wall and I would want one to use around the house just as my regular everyday <laughs> hammer. If I need to like fix something, I'm gonna use Feanor's hammer. I mean, come on. It's not falling <laughs> apart if you use that thing. Uh, I mean, 
I guess now here's where, you know, if, if we know the material and we know that they were allowed to ask Simon Tolkien for, hey, can we use this little piece? Can mm-hmm. we use this little piece? Then hopefully we get a cool little Fanor backstory flashback of a few minutes. That would be that would be awesome for for Silmarillion fans. You know, that would be just, you know, the thing we've been waiting for forever. OK, the final button on Fanor, though, Matt. You're the Mr. Lore on YouTube. Are you saying that having a statue of Fanor is not kosher with how Tolkien describes elves? Well, that was Cliff, actually, that was saying oh, that. that. But uh, yeah. Um, I'm, so- I'm sorry. But, uh, to, if you to, want to... me to chime in on it, I can't. I Please mean, do, that, yeah. That, I, think, I feel like, you know, like if we if we want to be super legalistic about things we can be but i i feel like you know ha- elves having you know statues uh you know isn't isn't like a deal breaker you know i am okay. much more concerned with you know thematically and you know the the characters themselves and the nature of the characters and the nature of the world being correct than you know if there's some some background statue, you know, statues, especially if that is, if that helps tell the story that they are telling, that's a pretty minor thing to get worked up about. Jason, does, uh, does Feanor have, does Feanor sing when he's hammering? Does he have a, 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 is he a musical guy? Uh, I mean, no, I mean, he had, he had at least like one incredible musical son. Um, but, uh, I, I, I mean, that would be pretty cool if they had him sing. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that would be terrible. <laughs> well, we've got our second. Uh, uh, that that was our first character leak. Um, let me move move, move the, the square down to seven new characters. So we have one. Seven. Number, number two. We can confirm that the actor that played the bloater on uh, The Last of Us has joined the cast and he is playing one of the main big orcs in season two of Rings of Power. Obviously, this isn't an orc, but he is known for uh, his performance under heavy prosthetics and everyone loved the work of the prosthetics in The Last of Us TV show that is still airing on HBO. So um, that is the second actor that is joining uh, and he's going to be a, a major orc probably uh, uh, you know probably replacing Jed Brophy who wasn't asked to come back uh, we've got three new actors which is a so crime shame three four five uh, Roxanne Nielsen and and shout out to Drew Halbrand for digging in on people's resumes and LinkedIn's and casting auditions and agent websites he really did some uh, research to find these. Uh, so you want to give Drew Halbrand a follow on Twitter. Um, so we've got Roxanne, who looks like an elf. Charlie Rich, unknown. But the Discord people seem to think that that could be Anatar or a version of Anatar. He's that got Charlie this. Rich so, guy oh. looks like an Anatar right there in that photo. That's for sure. Yeah. So I, I will say, you know, just touching on Feanor for a second, since we were talking about that actor, I did have the thought that that would be an interesting take if Anatar had a l- little resemblance to Feanor in some way. Interesting. Ah, to let Celebrimbor's guard down. Mm-hmm. Oh. If so there you, was, think... you know, not not a one-to-one. I'm not saying, like, that actor's face should be the face of Feanor, but if they were similar you know enough that you know maybe obviously different hair color or you know different features but, but like one of those, get calabrimbor drunk and he starts those, to look like feanor yeah, yeah yeah or like you know you you squint your eyes at him and you're like whoa or you know they look like they could be brothers or something you know there there could be some similarities both in in visually but then also demeanor obviously uh, Cliff, one of these guys is credited as a mage. What is a mage in the Legendarium? Um, Tolkien doesn't use that word, but we have <laughs> seen we again. in season one the three mages or the three um, acolytes. Right? Wait, what, what is, are they called acolytes properly? Is, yeah. they're, they're called Nazgals. That is... 
<laughs> yeah, Tolkien actually <laughs> used that word. <laughs> did did Tolkien use the word mage? Because I don't remember no. running across that. Well, I'm going to go to digitaltolkien.com and find out. Let's find out. Now, no results. I think that if you're going to have acolytes of Sauron in season one, who are these obviously magic users, then why not as, as the stranger and Nori travel further and further afield? Why don't they bump into some other interesting characters who might have uh, mystical powers? It is certainly possible with, you know, the, the unknown strange things that they're doing at Rings of Power. So that's just as likely as anything else. All right, what are you got, finding, Matt? We've got we've got uh, five. There's, there's no use of the word mage. There you go. According to Digital Tolkien. There you go. All right, uh, cast uh, cast yeah, leak number my, six. Cast leak number one. six. Uh, you might remember Martin Sokas mm -hmm. as uh, Celeborn. Celeborn, who Celeborn. Uh, is uh, joined by his lady Galadriel when the Fellowship meet them when they enter Lothlorien. Right. Eight that are here, yet nine set forth from Rivendell. <laughs> well, uh, the sleuths, again, on our Discord and across the internet, uh, put up one of the new actors announced uh, by um, Amazon for season two. And it is a spitting image. If you look at this. Oh, absolutely. The new actor overlaid wow. with Martin Sokas. Oh, absolutely. Is, I think we have our Celeborn. You know, when they announced the casting of Will Poulter, we were all saying the same thing, weren't we? We're saying, oh, wow, look at Will Poulter. And look at his amazing eyebrows. Look at what he could do compared to Hugo Weaving. It's the same thing. But then, uh, are ultimately, we, we lost Will Poulter. And that's okay. I love Robert Arameo, and I yeah, love what Robert great. is doing. But this casting is almost a photo-realistic, crazy connection, really. It, it's it, it, incredible casting. Um, and I should mention that this is another direct connection that Amazon is making to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. This is true. Somebody so, left a picture on a wall somewhere <laughs> since they weren't allowed to leave it. <laughs> you know, those pictures they weren't allowed to put up, but evidently they did. The one so, we still have in the show is Gil Galad. It's, um, they look oh, so similar. It's crazy. Yeah. Even in their Oh outfit. my gosh. Yeah, we can't forget that. That's all yeah, Benjamin amazing. Walker it's easy to forget. It's just like Mark Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Kelly, if does it feel that does, watching Rings of Power does it feel that we're actually watching a prequel, a real prequel, to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings? Ah! <laughs> is there potential to get to where you feel that this is a prequel? Oh yeah, of course. Sure. There's five seasons, but. Based on season one, for the issues I already, you know, said about not having the "this is a hallowed tale" sort of mm -hmm. feel, um, I I think we can maybe get there. I hope we can get there, but not not as it stands. Yeah. It's it's. I mean, you look at the, all the aspects of this show, and you know, I've, I mean, my my review video is an hour and fifteen minutes long, so I. <laughs> You know, obviously, uh, I'm not going to go on for that long talking it through all this. It won't take you that long to read my review. But <laughs> good. <laughs> but but you look at all the different elements of the show, and you can see how many areas of the show are really, really good. And it's just unfortunate that the you know story and writing are the two that are kind of pulling the rest down. Or you know, if you want to look at the other way, the rest of the the aspects are are like lifting the show up more um either way however you cut it so i i think they're you know uh i i don't like using the word salvageable because it's so dramatic but like the the show is totally salvageable like they they can make some changes and you know uh like get rid of the mystery box thing for one like 
that's that's step one. And you know they can they can course correct. That's how it, that's how I prefer to say it. They can course correct and get this to a place I think where where it could stand alongside you know what has come before. I think and, it's meant to, you know, uh, but I think it's yeah, like yeah, literally absolutely. meant to. No, um, I yeah, I think in in, in you know yeah. in imperfect execution, this would be a this would transition us straight into the trilogy. Um, but so I think they have some the, work. The Hobbit, though, right? Like, is that the real question? Is this no, leading into the Hobbit? Like, no, I think I I think the Hobbit's kind of you know its own. Thing you know, it it doesn't tie well. It doesn't tie as directly as you know, Lord of the Rings, because we go from you know what will be season five of Rings of Power is what the prequel or the prologue is in Fellowship of the Ring. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like right there, you know, where mm-hmm. there'll be a a slight bit of overlap because of the War of the Last Alliance. But it's kind of like you know we'll see the Last Alliance play out, and then Fellowship will just kind of recap it again for us. Um but but yeah they've they've got some you know they've got work to do uh in order to get to a point where you can say yes this show can stand alongside you know the movies that peter jackson did one of the things i thought that they achieved really well was was the more horror aspects the darkness the darkness the orcs are scarier in the messed up way yeah and um that's a strength and that's going to um be a great benefit to them moving forward as the storyline itself turns darker yeah i think I, the the orcs are scarier than i think oh yeah. possibly any time we've seen them before and part of my disconnect with rings of power was um or with aspects of it i should say was that we were seeing things that we all understand and acknowledge must exist in middle earth primarily a lot of women and we are seeing domestic spaces. We're seeing family units. Mm. And um, the trilogy, the original trilogy of books doesn't include that. It's not inclusive of that. Other than that, it's all nobility. Everyone except Mm. for Sam, Mary and Pippin are all of some higher standing or royalty. And so Rings of Power gives us some real people like Bronwyn, I actually really enjoyed her character and when i would sit around and daydream about wishing i could visit middle earth or go to middle earth there'd be this little voice in the back of my head being like do you though think of all the nasty things that are there and that scene in the first two episodes with the orc coming into her house and her and her son fighting for their lives really hit home how treacherous life could be for people and why the kingdoms formed as they did and so Tolkien alludes to this you know we're, we're meant to fill in the blanks and just assume that all the little people are out there living their lives on the frontier but to actually see it felt new and felt different and was a little jarring even though it shouldn't be and you know how many times have any of you been recommended a show by a friend and they say look season one is a little rough but as soon as you get to season two the show is awesome i think we're all hoping that we can say that to friends after season two comes out oh yeah hundred percent absolutely positively totally well the final the final character reveal again we have feanor and an actor we have one of the lead orcs and his actor. By the way, Jason, we didn't even get a chance for you to uh, give some tips for orc grunting. <laughs> it's just <laughs> use your diaphragm. If it hurts too much, uh, the, then you're hurting your throat. So that would be my. <laughs> if, if it starts to hurt, stop. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Possibly Anatar. The uh, fan casting right now. Number six, of course, young Caliborn. Number seven, I don't have a photo of it because he hasn't been drawn very much. But Fellowship of Fans has confirmed this week, Narvi is coming to season two. Nar- who is Narvi? Cliff, who is Narvi? Why is he significant? And should he be as young as all the other cast? When you have that famous scene outside the west gate of Moria where the Fellowship is trying to solve the riddle of the password, and Gandalf doesn't realize that the password is simply friend. And the inscription is explained in more detail 
in the book than it is in Peter's film. It's all about this beautiful gate was made by Keller Brimbor and another dude who was a dwarf uh, named Narvi. Am I getting all this right or wrong? Yeah. And yeah. there is a character who is probably going to become, uh, you know how strongly we're responding to the friendship between Prince Durin and Elrond? Well, now we get to see another dwarf and elf friendship getting to evolve and go to a place where the, the culture and the exchange and the economic exchange between Khazad-dûm and Aragion is so bountiful and so rich and so good, so healthy for both of these communities that they decide to make these new wonderful gates that actually establish we are friends, you are our neighbors, and we are engaged with you. We dwarves are not hiding anymore behind this tiny, tiny little door like the one that you saw in season one. So the significance of that little minuscule door being changed to a welcoming gate, a symbol of bounty, a symbol of the cornucopia of goodness between these two peoples in the best state of affairs that they ever had between them. That's what we get to look forward to with Narvi being our character taking us there. Will he be written as the pun master of Moria? Oh, God, no. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> well, the, cha the <laughs> chat room is starting to get ahead of me because the next segment is uh, Rings so, Power sorry, Season. Sorry, can I say something real quick, Justin, yes. on that? Go. Um, on Narvi, just real quick. Yeah. It's worth noting that he is said in Tolkien's text, it says that uh, the friendship between Celebrimbor and Narvi, that, it, that is Celebrimbor's greatest friendship is Narvi. So whoever in they cast has to have great chemistry with and Nar Bumble. isn't narvi your latest uh lore video on your YouTube it is channel? yes it is that, so this is this is top that? of mind so yeah. there are whispers that narvi might have been filmed in season one and cut out and what are we talking about here well uh one of the things that cliff i remember you scooped or uh, torn scooped early on was that they recast Celebrimbor in the middle of production. Oh, they sure did. They sure did. Do we have that picture? We have a the picture. Earlier, the yeah, earlier we had, fellow who uh, was going to and be And unfortunately, it was that, Stuart Townsend again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The guy exactly can't the catch a setup. break or <sighs> ride a horse. So that is Celebrimbor as we see him. Uh, Charles Edwards, he is one of my favorite favorite parts of the show and gosh i want all his merch i want his hammer i want his chaise lounge i want his outfits i want to oh. cosplay him at comic-con oh yes but the oh, yes. original i liked him a lot more than i thought i would brimby. this is this uncle is uncle brimby uncle brimby this is the original calibrimbor tom budge um obviously he is 20 or 30 years younger than charles edwards um Cliff, based on the rest of the cast being young, it kind of made sense to have a young Calibrimbor. But for some reason, it didn't work out. Is it a good sign for future seasons that Amazon decided to cast older when they recast him? Yes, because I've seen some... I've heard a lot of rumors about um, the the previous portrayal of this character by uh, Mr. Budge. I heard a lot of things going on that they were depicting him as a dither dithering, wacky, absent-minded professor type of character who actually ended up walking into the scene forgetting to put his pants on. Evidently, he was that kind of a, you know, Jerry Lewis absent-minded professor. And I don't think Keller Brimbor being portrayed that way would have gone over quite so well. You know, forgetting his daily clothing and being so wrapped up in his mental dreamscape of making rings. You know, it's a very, very good sign that they departed from that. That would have been a Stuart Townsend situation. I much prefer where we are with Mr. Edwards, just speaking for myself. 
Matt, I don't know. I don't know if you you heard heard the rumors, but so this scene, I had uh, no idea what what Cliff. Okay, just so so what was cut? Me with terror. Matt's Matt's brain so, just so, exploded. Like, oh the, my god! The, this shot is from the scene where Elrond and Calabrimbor try to enter yeah. Casa Doom for they the first Kaza time. Doom. Yeah, and what happens? Uh, uh, that dwarves say. We'll only allow Elrond in Celebrimbor. You can't come in. And then yeah. the show doesn't show Celebrimbor. Uh, I guess they just, he just walks away. It's that teleporting issue yeah. that Cliff, yeah. you keep talking about. Like, well, look. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that shot. They don't even have any travel gear. They don't even have any travel <laughs> gear. What is going on? <laughs> and they're still wearing their beautiful, like, uh, velvet robes. Yeah. Uh, I would have loved a two second travel, shot of them yeah. just jumping. Two second shot of them like getting out of a carriage or something. Yeah. So, uh, so this was a reshoot because he was recast. What originally happened was, and again, this is Green Dragon gossip, but according to the footage, what we've heard footage was cut. Calabrimbor actually does enter. Young Calabrimbor, Tom Budge, enters Casa Doom. And all of the scenes that you see with Dissa and Durin. And Elrond also included Celebrimbor. And Celebrimbor was part of the entire Dwarven storyline in Season 1. He was at the dinner table. He was always there. They edited him out. In post-production, they cut him out completely. They, they and, and, and if you look at the, the shots, how they're framed, there's uh, uh, Elrond is like sat over here close to camera, and then the two dwarves are in the middle, kind of smaller, and then they're supposed to big empty space over here. That's where Celebrimbor was, being all big and tall in the frame. So uh, Celebrimbor was originally supposed to, it was originally filmed with Tom Budge, and because he was already filmed, he was building relationships with the dwarves, and remember. How like when Sauron is walking through, uh, walking through um, uh, Numenor, and he eyes the smiths, you know, like as he's walking by, like oh, oh, that. Celebrimbor does the same thing. He eyes a smith over there, and he befriends Narvi. Mm. So the rumors are is that Narvi was originally filmed to be introduced in season one, and that Celebrimbor had a huge role to play in all the dwarven wow. scenes. That, Th wow. That's oh, what that, was cut. So, so one of my big complaints wow. with, you know, uh, season one is that we didn't get nearly enough Celebrimbor. And that the mm -hmm. the culmination, you know, the, my, my, one of my biggest overall complaints is the creation of the Rings of Power felt so crammed in and uh, didn't come with the emotional weight that it needed to. And... Celebrimbor especially that that moment should have been a huge moment for that character and we hardly got to see him before that so yeah this this is very interesting to hear these rumors um it yeah. it kind of explains a lot i would say that 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 makes this not quite a Stuart Townsend thing because they determined pretty early on that Stuart Townsend was not the guy uh, this sounds like they got much further down the field before deciding to pull him out of the game. Okay. Indeed. And it also explains why Celebrimbor is so much older than every other actor because they made a choice at that point in time when they decided to recast. They realized, wow, this entire show is too young. Like, it's not working. It's not working. And so Celebrimbor mm. was the first older actor to be portrayed. So, Cliff, you think mm -hmm. I'm joking about Narvi being the pun master, but based on what you heard of, like, the antics that Celebrimbor was being portrayed, and my whispers that Narvi is a little, like, fun little, fun little dwarf, can you imagine that they wrote Narvi as a little jokester, a little prankster? I, I, I could only imagine... But you know what? My imagination doesn't work these days as much as it used to. <laughs> I can only imagine, dude. But I do need to say caveat to the audience. Everything that I said about, you know, the Tom Budge performances was all unsubstantiated. Yeah, Green I mean, Dragon. Well, it was unconfirmed rumors, but 
they were substantial enough rumors that I held on to them and, and wanted to share them with you tonight, uh, dear audience. Um, I am just as intrigued at a different type of a dwarven portrayal as long as it works within the society and the culture that is happening right now things at the near the end of the second age are pretty specific and i i am i see a lot of how distrustful uh durin is king i mean king durin remains highly distrustful of what's going on with anybody outside of Khazad Doom. So, you know, it looks like Elrond and Narvi are going to have a lot of work to do in bringing that situation around. It the best stuff of season 1 is clearly the Khazad Doom stuff. It's the best stuff to me. I love it and I'm very willing to go back to it. I can't wait to see what they do, really. So, out of the 7 new characters like three or four of them three of them are canon we've already determined that a couple things are a little out of whack from you know how tolkien wrote lower statues and the word mage everything like that but does this feel like uh and we'll start with kelly does this feel like this could be heading back on track on the right track i don't like spoilers (laughs) This is all gossip. We don't even know, know if it's, it's true. It's all gossip, but like, I want to just watch the show when it's when it's <laughs> when it's out. I think that um, the casting isn't necessarily indicative of that, but I think that uh, I mean it's not indicative one way or the other. I th- I think that. I'm just excited to see where it goes. It's kind of a non-answer. I apologize. <laughs> but I am really excited to meet Narvi. And I'm, as people were saying in the chat, Owen did such a phenomenal performance as Durin and yeah. became like, to me, he's probably my, f- uh, might regret saying this, but he's probably <laughs> my favorite dwarf performer. Like his character and, and some of it's the advancements in technology of how he's able to make more minute facial expressions and just convey more impishness or more frustration. Um, And he took the character from being like the jokester to the jokester who's messing with you for a reason um, and is also a prince. And so with the introduction of Narvi, with them having done Durin so well, and his father and Disa too, they were done really well as well. And so I am hopeful. I am hopeful that it's. I hope that they're 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 feeling everything out and they're learning what their strengths are and they'll start playing up their strengths. Are you gonna Are you gonna make an effort to like remain spoiler free and like go into season two kind of, you know, like, blank slate? With, he asks. He asks this after. After. I know. You I should have favorite. asked before. Yeah. <laughs> With these, the friends I, and the company I keep, it's kind of tough. I was literally at Comic Con <laughs> last year while Jed Brophy was talking, and I was plugging my ears and humming, <laughs> like pretending to look through something in the back. Like, <laughs> and so I'll do my best. I will do my best, but ultimately, but- I um, am not emotionally invested enough to like really have my heart broken if I hear a big plot point. Mm and have that be spoiled but i still would like to avoid that uh varking is in the chat room asking does he not count as a dwarf performer to be your favorite he's my favorite man dwarf (laughs) (laughs) and now i'm just thinking about charles edwards pantsless (laughs) (laughs) you know what could have been can we just clip that and post Post uh, Jason saying that on Twitter and just <laughs> out right. of context. No <laughs> and then Tag finally, Charles. finally we've got. Uh, oh, before uh, uh, yeah, I've got I've got two little things at the end of the show. But uh, new Lord of the Rings films confirmed and rumored. So I, we just want to set it clear: Warner Brothers isn't even close to announcing new movies. All they have in production is War of the Rohirrim, an anime right. film. And, and Matt, you were doing some some research today. Do mm-hmm. anime films make money? Um, 
I mean, they make they make some. We, I, Justin and I were texting um, about like all time um, biggest anime film box office, and I think it was uh, five hundred million. I think was wasn't that what I texted you? I don't I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. Um. um but not yeah, that, so not so, that we're counting dollars, but no, no, but like it, it's kind of a measure of you know audience interest you know how how many people flock to the the theaters um if you just do animated then obviously you're dealing with a whole another ball of wax because then you've got like Disney frozen and, and yeah, yeah all that stuff um but yeah straight anime um i i think it was around 500 million um so yeah i, w- I was just sharing with you justin that i think a lord of the rings property done in anime you you could see that you know cracking of of substantial spot on the all-time list of anime box office potentially did anyone see the new puss in boots movie animated movie did yes it's really good it's great and remember puss in boots is a spinoff of a spinoff right because shrek and then shrek 2 introduced the character and now it's a Puss in Boots is a sequel to a spinoff of a of a sequel <laughs> of so that's how far I think Lord of the Rings can go. The, there's so many characters that are so interesting that you yeah, could do you could do that, but don't knock Puss in Boots: The Last Wish because it's one of the stronger entries in the field of animated features that DreamWorks has bothered to give us in a long yeah. time. It's a great movie. I love that movie. It really that is, is a great, great movie. Death yeah. is a great villain in that movie. Yep. Yeah. It's really okay. well done. Just don't knock it. We talked um, we, we talked a little and what Kelly what Kelly said earlier is bears repeating here. Like, yes, there's a lot of characters, but you know, I, I think Tolkien fandom is different. You know, we've talked about comic book movies, we we're talking about, you know, silly Shrek characters and stuff, you know, cute kittens, puss in boots here, but like Tolkien is a different beast, so like you can't just say, "Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna cherry pick this character over here and we're just gonna uh, do a movie on it," because it's so easy to go into straight cash grab territory, and it's it could ring hollow. And I I don't think the Tolkien fandom will put up with that. Like we're we're not gonna like Kelly said, we're not just gonna you know watch and love it automatically because oh you know we're just we're just so thankful because someone's giving attention and making an adaptation of you know the uh the origins of narvi or bard the bowman or something you know wait like you mean these, there's not going to be a bill Fairney uh pony training bill, yes. coming of age story yeah the the trek uh, the trek back home to the to uh brie for bill the pony yeah but as, um, as, as arrogant as it may sound we have all been through a vetting process because these are books yeah. number one and a lot of people don't read anymore but they're thick books and they're dense yeah. books so we've already most of us who are passionate have already gone through this process of being deeply involved in these tomes um that's going to kind of separate you know the way people think and interact with and digest their media yeah and not trying to alienate people who are only fans of the films at all that certainly has its its place and there's a lot of different reasons why some people don't read the books but um yeah, there, there. It just speaks to a certain mindset and a certain personality type. If you are willing to read these books, and and I will be the first to say that Tolkien is not an easy read. Mm-hmm. So, um, when you're starting at this level of comprehension, you need to meet the fans there, rather than lower the bar. Yeah, what and I think, it, I I think with, um, you know the. The thing that Peter Jackson did so well in The Lord of the Rings is he captures those things that appeal to the book fans, like the magic of Tolkien's writing. So even if you haven't read the books, part of the reason that Lord of the Rings, you know, appeals to so many people, even if they only watch the films, is because it's so well capturing what is great about Tolkien's writings. And, you know, that that won't be in a in a cash grab piece, you know, if we're doing, you know, uh, Bill, 
Bill the Pony or whatever. Like that's. I mean, I kind of like to see that. I mean, though. okay. Pony, I, I know, I'm bound. not to dig. Like... Not to dig on the homeward bound Bill the Pony idea. Okay, but you know, what it, whatever it is, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Grishnak origins or something. Maybe I don't know, but. But yeah, like there, there's a certain threshold that you know, if you if you hope to catch even a percent of the magic that, you know, those Lord of the Rings films did, you're you're gonna have to bring something substantial to the table. Yeah. Well, Embracer has already Fair. said that their interest is in a bunch of character spinoffs like that. Uh, Jason, uh, video games, especially the Lord of the Rings video games, don't really get any flack. For not connecting to the broader whole. You've got Lotro, Lord of the Rings Online over here. You've got the Golem game. You've got your Easy mobile Easy with games. Lotro. Lotro is a very faithful adaptation, Justin. No, well, don't what I'm saying is they don't connect to each other. Each of them oh, play yeah, okay, okay. in their own right. sandbox. In their own, so yeah, their own universe. should... I mean, you get Calibrimbor in the, uh, like, right, the... Uh, Shadow, Shadow of Mordor, Shadows yeah. of Mordor, you know, this is a lot of like more casual fans introduction to who Celebrimbor was at the first time. So um, you've got some people that were expecting that kind of Celebrimbor. Do you do you think we should as fans be prepared for movies and TV shows that are like the video games just in their own sandbox? Or should the studios just figure it out and stay on a single timeline? I mean, I would love it if they stayed on a single timeline, but I think it's going to be more, I know we've been comparing it all night long to the MCU. When Sony had Spider-Man and a few other Marvel characters, and then you had the MCU with the bulk of the Marvel characters, and then you had, actually Sony also had X-Men. And um, they had similar looks and similar vibes. Now they've all, they're working together. Maybe we'll see that. Maybe Amazon will buy Warner Brothers. You know, who knows, right? We don't know what's going to happen uh, down the line. Mm. And, you know, so I, I think it's the same thing that um, I, I think, like, as a fan, um, I do love different interpretations of it. There's still things from the Ralph Bakshi movie that I love in more than any other uh, interpretation. Um, believe it or not, yep. there's just vi there's a vibe to that movie that still kind of takes yep. me to Middle Earth in a weird way that none other have have captured. So I I think it'll be good to have these different view viewpoints to it. Um, I think I will absorb all of it and consume all of it and and probably. Um, like what Kelly was saying, like anyone that's really invested in the books, we're going to watch them all. We're going to watch them all and we're going to we're going to analyze them all. So. Well, Warner Warner Brothers has already done the Joker, which is separate from the DCU. And they've done the Batman with Robert Pattinson, which is separate from the DCU and James Gunn's DCU. And both of those are very, very well done movies. And Joker's getting a sequel now with uh, um you know, uh, with Joaquin Lady Phoenix. Gaga. So, uh, so do you want? Do you think Lord of the Rings is a type of franchise IP that supports multiple sandboxes, like they're doing with DC already? I mean, I I think you know when we're talking Amazon versus Warner Brothers, I think you could totally have two sandboxes going on and you know not everything has to i mean I, I think there's a difference between being connected and being interdependent um so you know with the marvel model it, you know the post credit scenes are always a teaser for the next movie right and there's all these references where you you walk into a movie and you're like okay how many other marvel movies do i have to have seen for all of this to make sense for me um so I don't I don't think it, they have to go that far, but you know if you're making you know my what would be my first pick is the War in the North, um, for Warner Brothers, and if you're making that, there's no reason, you know that that can't be set. It should be set in the same universe that Peter Jackson has established, and then if you turn from that and do the Angmar War, um, you don't have to have seen War in the North. Uh, to be able to appreciate Angmar War or to get what's going on. Like they, they're they completely separate stories 
and there's no interdependency there, but they're in the same universe, if that makes sense. I think that that could be the model that would work the best for Middle Earth. Kelly, I'll second that emotion. Uh, Kelly, what is your first spin -off, character spinoff dream project? What do you want them to announce first? You're muted. Aragorn. <laughs> really? I knee jerk. I just go back to you know my fangirl days when the original films came out. Like those were the fan fictions I wrote and read with the adventures of young Aragorn, mm -hmm. like he and Legolas running around taking names, you know, having battles and you know learning about different parts of Middle Earth. And you know, come to think of it. I, you know, it was what I said previously was a little arrogant because a lot of what I learned about Middle Earth was through fan fiction, not particularly through Tolkien. Like I trickled into the books, <laughs> but I was like learning through reading other people's interpretations. So I don't know what do you do with that. It's getting kind of meta. Cliff, what's your f first dream project? What did what should um, they announce? Actually, actually, there's a there's a couple of them, really. There's a couple of dream projects, and one of them is um, I want to learn more about uh, the, uh, the I, I want to learn more about those stories that are never told. I want to learn about Glorfindel. His story is never told. It's always cut. Any adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien, they'll always cut that story. And he has such a fascinating story. Um, it also seems that the scouring of the Shire is my number two idea of an untold story that can be fully visited. And you know what else is missing? There's not much Tom Bombadil. And boy, could he have some adventures that are of a very different tone. It doesn't have to be all the serious sturm and drang and operatic saga you could get down into the weeds with Tom Bombadil, and I mean literally lily pads, rose bushes, weeds, and plants. That's what I'm talking about. You, we could have like a travel log. What is a travel log? Well, visiting lots of unique locations, and imagine Tom Bombadil having bizarre encounters with creatures and people in Middle Earth, and he's not even connected. He doesn't care about the larger stories. He's just doing his own stuff, like Hitchhiker's Guide to Middle Earth with Tom Bombadil. You know what I well, mean? What Jason, do you guys think of that idea? J well, Jason, isn't Joker Part 2 a musical? I haven't heard that yet, but it uh, makes sense then that Lady Gaga is going to be um, Harley Quinn. So should Tom Bombadil be a musical? Yeah, absolutely. And starring Jack Black. Oh, I would yeah. say Matt Berry. Oh yeah, or oh, or Matt Berry. I'll take you the one. I'll take or you the one. or Ron uh, Swanson. What's his name? Nick oh, Offerman. Yeah. Nick Offerman. Nick Offerman. <laughs> yeah, but I'm with I'm with Matt. I kind of want to see the War of the North first. Yeah. I want I want to see the Witch King. I think it would be really cool for there to be a Witch King origin story. Like, how did he become king? How did he become a witch? Like, let's get into it. We, you know, I, I want, I want to see that. Maybe he was good at one point. Let's see him get corrupted by the ring. Will that be covered in, in Rings of Power, or could they make a separate movie about it? Well, uh, uh, there, everyone in the chat room has an opinion. Adelante says, "I want the Ring Wraith backstories." I think that's exactly what the Rings of Power TV show is. Like right. that's exactly right. the Shit. story that you're going to get over the next four seasons is the ring wraith story. Um, so uh, I, th I think you're getting that. And if, if that's the rings power story, d Warner brothers doesn't really need to tread there. Right? Like just let them that's tell right. that part of the story. Right. I agree with and that. Let's get, let's get the Tom Bombadil musical trilogy. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, it, I love it. I you know I mentioned it at the top of the sh uh, uh, earlier in the show. 
and I'm not joking. I want Lee Pace as Thranduil. I want his whole backstory. I want everything to do with Lee Pace. I want a character study with Lee Pace as Thranduil. I want to know why his, what the magic is that is covering his face. I want to know which dragon he fought, and why. I want to know. Every, I want to know why he's scared of Smaug. I want to know why in the Peter Jackson universe. Does he know about the darkness coming? Like, how does Thranduil know? And he he, he he walls off. Why does he let Mirkwood become Mirkwood instead of Greenwood? There's so much with with Peter Jackson's version of Thranduil that I'm excited. And, well, man, there's so much going on. I don't think, like, you know, the press, Hollywood Reporter, other places are going to say, is this too much Lord of the Rings? Are we going to get exhausted? Is are they are we going to get like Star Wars exhausted or Marvel exhausted with with Lord of the Rings between these two studios doing the thing? I don't know. The, the correct me if I'm wrong, but everyone here on the panel kind of says we want to play in Middle Earth. Let people play in Middle Earth. We, right? We're like, a far we are a far cry from you know where Marvel is now and where Star Wars was when they were releasing a film every year and also having TV shows going on, you know, like we're, I I think that's a little knee jerk. And maybe right. Maybe it's a, a uh, valid, you know, skepticism to have that that's the nature of how um, these things tend to go nowadays. But, you know, we, we haven't even had anything beyond war of the Rohirrim announced, let alone gone into production. So, um, personally right now i'm i'm not even close to worrying about fatigue at the moment um i'm just enjoying the excitement of the idea that we might not only be getting well that we are getting more films but that we might be going back into peter jackson's universe and peter jackson might be returning to it um i'm just kind of enjoying that hype right now Mm -hmm. kelly as you were writing the book which people in chat room are asking is there going to be a second printing of your book middle earth script to screen because everybody wants a copy uh, of, of, of that have you heard anything i have not no unfortunately your... that would be harper harper design it would be the folks to write to because they're the ones right who to them published it's it amazing yeah. this book oh. is awesome in your research for that book kelly is there stuff you don't have to go to specifics is there design and stuff that Weta did as part of the development process that we haven't seen that could be used for spinoffs? Oh, for spinoffs. Possibly, but most of what they were creating um, was, was, wasn't was too tangential to the main storyline I mean, for understandable reasons. But is the imaginative talent there? to at the drop of a hat do that absolutely <laughs> yes indeed totally that, and that is an encouraging thought oh. um it looks like our special guest jason c miller needs to leave um your amiable co-host he needs to leave it looks like we're almost near the we're end. All, all right i've got one together. i've got one i promised matt one special treat I, and i haven't told cliff this or anything Show us what you got. All right. Well, folks, uh, let me see if I can bring this up on screen. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> um, folks, now that Warner Brothers has secured the rights, uh, the the presses are going wild. Universal Studios is building Lord of the Rings theme park in Orlando. Uh, it's part of Epic Universe. Um, there is a map of epic universe with wizarding world nintendo world universal classic monsters and the how to train your dragon and the biggest land is the lord of the rings land it's going to have its own land it's going to be so well developed that once you enter you you can't see anything else and the big rumor green dragon gossip that i would okay, like so to... this is rumor so this is rumor right now I have to say everything is rumor okay. until until there's a press release. Okay. Uh, the lawyers have told me. So the big green <laughs> dragon gossip is, uh, okay, part rumor, part truth. Truth, the park that Universal is building 
And I looked this up because there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, Florida and Disney and, and law. The park is not in the Orlando city limits. It's outside city limits. So this park, specifically the Lord of the Rings park, does not have any air and firework regulations. So that's fact. The nice. Green Dragon Gossip is Universal is currently testing drone light fireworks to replicate actual dragons flying <laughs> towards oh. you at night. And if you've seen, if you go to YouTube and look for drone fireworks, you know it's real. You know the technology exists. And I can tell you right now that the Green Dragon Gossip is they are testing drone fireworks in their Shire land. So at night, the fireworks spectacular will have a dragon coming down towards you just <laughs> like the movie. Oh, this is so fun. Okay. <laughs> this is what I love most about this show is when we say crazy, crazy shit that we can't back up at all. I love this part of the show. I really do. Well, look, it. hey, Cliff, it took four years for people to confirm our young Aragorn gossip. So That's true. And it was confirmed. It and it was confirmed. It Almost everything we say on this show ends up confirmed. It might take a decade, well, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Matt, Matt, These are did... so cool. I'm watching the videos of drone fireworks right now. It's super cool. <laughs> it, it is. It's a very cool rumor. And you know what? It, I'm it is so inevitable. excited about this park, man. You have no <laughs> idea. The, the idea of a Tolkien theme park is oh. something you have to file under inevitable. It's just going to bound to happen. But we've got people who need to go. I've got to go. All right. We're done. Go. Take us out, Cliff. <laughs> it's a fantastic show. And I cannot thank you enough. So from the bottom of my hobbity little heart, thank you, everybody, for being on our panel today. Jason, Kelly, Matt, you guys are so amazing. Thank you for your time. And to our very faithful audience, thank you for coming to join us again. Justin, you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> really good stuff. Um, we have a lot more to share with you guys next week right here on Torn Tuesday. So come and join us next week at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, and we will talk nonsense and maybe we'll talk some real sense i hope we can do that too um you guys be careful and take care of yourselves stay warm and safe and until next tuesday follow us on social media if you want to shout out where are you i'm at quick beam 2000 matt go oh uh i'm here on youtube uh nerd of the rings that's me jason i'm jason charles miller everywhere so just type that into your favorite social media and you'll find me there Kaylee, Kelly. I have too many names. I'm Happy Hobbit on YouTube and social media, and as an author, my initials K M Rice. K M Rice, published author. Oh my gosh, Middle Earth from script to screen. There better be a second edition. I'm dying here. Uh, Justin, you're the best. You guys be safe out there, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Until then, good night and good luck. Or better yet, buenos noches y buena suerte. Bye. Bye. Meet you guys in Orlando.